You're hanging out with some friends and putting back a few drinks. A few becomes a few too many. As the evening comes to an end and people start heading out, you think of calling for a ride. Nah, you live nearby. You can make it home okay. It's no big deal. What are the odds you get pulled over anyway? And even so, what's the worst that could happen? Your insurance goes up, you lose your license, you lose your job, you total your car, you kill someone? Everyone knows about the risks of driving drunk. The results are tragic and often deadly. However, that doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our roads to save lives. So if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. Play it safe and plan ahead to get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. Dak Prescott here. Why do I choose proven quality sleep from Sleep Number? Because better sleep elevates my game. Only my Sleep Number 360 smart bed helps me fall asleep faster, keeps me cool, and effortlessly adjusts for my best sleep. The result? 28 minutes more restful sleep a night. That's more focus, more edge, and more highlights. And that means more wins for all of us. Don't miss the final days of the biggest sale of the year. Save 50% on the Sleep Number 360 limited edition smart bed. Ends Monday. To learn more, go to sleepnumber.com. Sleep Number, the official sleep and wellness partner of the NFL. Podcast One presents the Steve Austin Show Classics. I was still sitting there with McFoley, so I needed to weigh in, and that was it. When we last left off last week, we were going to talk about promos, ECW, and all that stuff, and we're going to get to it. But I first wanted to uh, address something in the uh, current scheme of things, Mick, because I know you still watch the show today, yep. and uh, I know you're particularly fond of a talent, Daniel Bryan. Yeah. Very talented cat, uh, myself as well. Love what he does inside the squared circle. He's kind of been uh, put on the shelf right now. He had a neck injury, had some surgery, and word on the street is he's got another surgery coming up. I guess he's got some issues with his arm or whatever. I'm not a doctor, don't know the bottom line on it. But, man, your thoughts on that guy. He's worked his ass off to get to this point, a smaller guy, you know, with a hell of a damn. He's one of the best workers in the business when he's healthy and now on the sidelines. And he just came in to good money at top guy status. Uh, you know anything about his condition? What are your thoughts? Because you were very vocal when they were kind of had him on the – they were teeter-tottering. What do we do with this guy? Is he over on the Internet or is he over? And I was thinking the kid's over. The kid's yeah. over. You were too. I so was you were too. behind the Daniel Bryan cause. I, I Pull was. Pull the trigger on him. Put the belt on him at Mania. Let's go. And uh, I don't know for a fact that my opinion you know, changed anybody else's, but I know they were reading everything that I right. wrote. Um, that was the one time, and I, like I, we were talking about last week, you know, I didn't complain about every paycheck. You know, it was right. a, a rarity. It was regular enough that they knew that there would be a phone call if I got something I thought was light. Uh, but I very rarely weigh in on content. You know, I, I mean, I, I, especially when I was, a. um, you know, I was uh, a paid ambassador, you know, and I, and for the, by and large, I did, I, I did enjoy the product. Like if I, I wrote a, post the 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 famous tweet was following the royal rumble was and i don't even remember writing it you know i know it's mine i don't remember like think what i was thinking when i sent out does at wwe hate its own fans i've never been so disgusted after a ppv and apparently i was voicing what was on a lot of people's minds because my son said dad you know how many retweets you got not to turn this into a tech fest you know but Go ahead. Uh, the most I'd ever gotten was when, when the, the king had had the heart attack on live TV, and I'd sent out a very earnest prayer, and I got about 2,500 retweets. And I thought that was probably in the uh, the territory. And he goes, no, 16,000. Wow. I went up, I think, to like 25,000. Like I was in Justin Bieber territory all of a sudden because I was echoing what was on a lot of people's minds and probably on the minds of a lot of the guys, too, who, you know, weren't in a position to say anything. And I also, you know, I reached out to the three guys that I thought had been most grievously harmed that night, and that was uh, uh, Ziggler, Punk, and Daniel. It was a, I'm a glass half full guy. So the glass half full is that my kids looked on in amazement as these top guys in the company got back to me within like minutes, you know, and they're like, you know, Dad, like, why, why, why do they respond so quickly, dear? And I said, y- you don't know. And he said, no. I said, because I'm Mick fucking Foley. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! You see what it's I did? Stole there? It. I stole it, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's a joke between me and Mick. God damn it, kid! 
<laughs> Last week it was Cactus Fucking Jack. This week is Mick Fucking Foley. <laughs> What I was, I was, uh, I real adamant about it. I, I love the, I love the product, right? right. You know, and, well, I know, hey, but see, yeah. well, here's the thing: my time has come and gone. Yours has too. Yeah. But I was, I still reserve the right to voice my opinion yes. and be passionate about the product because yes. I care about today's guys and gals, and I care, I care about the system. Yeah. So I don't, I'm not bitter at all, but you know, I am passionate and I still love the business. So I want to voice my concerns. I just don't, and you don't, we don't want to come off as craggy, bitter, right. you know, just mad at the world because yeah. we're not. No. The glass is half full. <laughs> Some bits are damn near full in my opinion. Even I'm, I'm going through a, a strained period with WWE, and I'm seriously looking at it like this is a moment. You know, this is a, how strained is it? What's it's strained? Pretty, pretty. Y- y'all you know. pull a hamstring? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, strained enough so that even when I when I offered when I was in Boston and offered to do you know pre or post show and right. ten minutes away do my own show, which has been booked months earlier. You know, they didn't get back. Mark Carano said, I'll check and see. They didn't get back to me. And so I just thought, you know what? Let's take some time away. You know, maybe I'll have to miss this Thanksgiving. You know, maybe there'll be a WrestleMania that'll pass. But I don't in any way see, like, the door being shut. You know, like, back when I thought it was shut, I got a call from Vince, you know, we hadn't talked in a year and a half. And he said, I know you don't like me, but I know you love this company. And I called him back, and I got that voice. And you, you can't help but laugh. And the first thing I said was, I like you. And I know there's going to come another call like right. that. Like, I, I don't in any way think, WWE's my home, and I'm away for a little while. I'll go back. But in the meantime, you know, what I say, I have it on good authority that what I say is listened to, is measured out. That night in question, you know, I, I told, uh, I didn't have Daniel's cell. <laughs> So I conveniently reached out to to Bree. You know, it's yeah. funny because the, the, the so you had Bree Selma, not, not <laughs> yeah, Daniels. That makes total sense. It's his wife. <laughs> but she's a great. When kid. you can pop Mick Foley, you can pop anybody. <laughs> I should just ask her for Daniels' number. You know, <laughs> I guess I could. <laughs> See what he did, folks. The kid stole it. But I, I uh, you know, the, the Daniel Bryan Kane thing, hug it out, began as a rib on Daniel because he's yeah. not a hugger. You yeah. know, like oh, yeah. even even not you and I, we bro it out a little yeah. bit. But you'll see Daniel and specifically like the divas will go up and extend a an ha- hand. And I asked him and he goes, I, I don't I don't hug. And then I'm watching TV a couple months later and he's doing this thing that's based around two guys hugging each other. Like it's a rib, you know, it's it's a rib on Daniel that ended up being big money and catapulted him, get, you know, put, you know, another just great year under Kane's belt. Uh, (laughs) And so I, I, I said to Bree, I said, you know, I know Daniel's not a hugger, but if I was here, I told her I'm going to reach out, you know, to the, you know, the three people, Hunter, Stephanie, Vince, and tell them how wrong this whole thing is. And then I texted her back and I said, I just got on a cell phone, didn't really know the ins and outs of it, didn't know copying and pasting. And I said, I know Daniel's not a hugger, but tell him if I was there, I'd give him a big hug and tell him how messed up this whole thing is. And then I handed the phone to my son to try to like, you know, do this, you know, copying and pasting. He goes, Dad, you you just sent that to Vince McMahon. And I hadn't texted Vince in about a year. So my first text to Vince was, I'd give Daniel Bryan a hug. (laughs) And my second text was, oops. Are you kidding me? I know. I Jesus swear to you. Jesus Christ. I may even, I, I, while we talk, I'll see if I still have that on the Foley you're record. You're a moron. <laughs> I did, and I did. Uh, boy, I'll you t- told him. <laughs> oh, boy, yeah. I did I did reach out to Hunter, and I, I reached out to Stephanie. Hunter got back to me, and he said, Mick, as an author, you should know not to judge a book, you know, uh, by, you know until the story's over. Yeah. And the funny thing about Stephanie, and I've known Stephanie, you know, since she was, a, you know, a, a teenager in, in Yeah, when we first got there, you got there. Little, yeah. I, actually, she told me the story of how we first met. Was uh, It was the set, night of the cell, and now it can be told because Pat Patterson has revealed it on, on uh, Legend's, uh, House. Legend's House. You know, Pat had a longtime partner who passed away that night. 
And Stephanie remembers being, I think, 19 or 20 years old. This is after my cell match. You know, Francois kind of patched me together. I hobble over before the world's most awkward run in on your match. Like, <laughs> let me break into this story. I want to get into this later. We'll get into it right now. Dude, I got so much respect for you. You went through that hell in the cell match. Yourself and The Undertaker was a semi main. It was me yes. and Kane in the main event in the first blood match. Now, Four days earlier, I had wrestled you at the Houston Summit. We were on top. Place was sold out. Sold out. Coming out of that match, I couldn't stop shaking. I got the, whatever you call it, the chills. They took me to the hospital. I had a staph infection. Okay. My mom and dad had drove 100 miles from Edna, Texas, to watch me wrestle your ass that night. And thank God I was lucky enough to go over. <laughs> <laughs> And these days, as we speak now, Joel Osteen's packing them in every Sunday night doing his uh, ministry gimmick over there. But anyway, you and me working on top. I spent uh, three days at Herman Hospital, IVs, getting uh, uh, antibiotics put into my system. My elbow was swollen up. Badass staph infection. Had to wrestle you in a pay-per-view. Hell in a cell. I mean, uh, uh, first blood match. And, uh, man, you and Undertaker went out there and just ripped it up and some gr a great story great bumps just uh y'all stole the Emotional, show from us. yeah well, you, you can't follow that but my yeah. point is after all the devastation you had sustained in that match here you come and I always tell his people i say here comes that stupid ass jack running out because you got to take a stunner and yeah. i meant that with, with respect yeah you know here I comes that, jack yeah. running out there i mean kind of sideways like john wayne like a crab <laughs> And all the stuff, I mean, dude, that, those bumps you took, that one where you almost drove your head oh, in the mat, man. had you, you know, turned your shoulder, I, it was just a fluke that you didn't get killed. But here you come after all that bullshit that you had just went through, all those bumps, the thumbtacks, to take a stunner from my ass for me to feed into the chair to get the color from a taker. But I'll never forget that. Now, y'all stole the show hands down, more power to you. But I just respected the shit out of you for running down and taking a stunner. But and we got to get back to your story. In retrospect, that's probably one of those things that we should have changed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I'm pretty you sure know they went to you and got Steve, given what Mick's been through, like, we're not going to send him back. I think everyone would have been understanding of that. But You know, you're so right, but we didn't think like <laughs> no, that no. back then. No, and we didn't. And I've, I've mentioned, uh, uh, you know, this was more last year's show. I was talking about the, you know, the irony. Uh, professional wrestling is, you know, it's it's the sport that, you know, most people there are, are wrestling fans that go to my shows. I say everybody's been mocked or derided a time or two for watching that fake sport, the show business sport. I said, but, you know, you walk up to the most ardent MMA enthusiast and say, hey, man, does your sport continue when one of the participants is no longer conscious? <laughs> yeah. His mind does. Yeah. Yeah, I said, and then, I, you know, the fun of it is, like, you can play with the words a hundred different ways, you know, and I'll do it like, we didn't stop matches. And if I'm feeling good, we didn't stop matches. We bought time. <laughs> and you can almost picture Vince behind the curtain going, buy him some time. Yeah. And so you're, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the emotions of the match is trying to piece together this outcome, get to the desired outcome when one of the guys is, is no longer conscious. And I think that's, you know, where the drama of it comes in. But let me go back to Stephanie. Yeah, back to the story at hand. Sorry, I, uh, I had to interject. I find out in between being patched up and, and making the world's most awkward run in, Pat uh, Patterson's partner has passed away. And I went you know, to the, with the office he was in. He was beside himself. And I gave him a hug. And I don't remember this. And Stephanie says, I saw her out of the corner of my eye. And I gave her a little crooked smile. That was how we met. And here's here is the text. Uh, I did I, I, I what I did. I was copying and pasting, and it said, "Thence, this is th thence. It's Mick Foley, as you know. I don't reach out to you too often, but I think the company's making a big mistake by not giving the people what they want." And Daniel Bryan. Then I think I'm texting Bree, and I say, "I think I'm I copying and pasting yeah. the message." I said that was my message to Vince, even though I misspelled his name. I know Brian is not a hugger, but tell him I would give him one now if I could. I'll leave you guys alone now. I just wanted you to know how I felt and how wrong I think it is. And then <laughs> you read that yourself. Vince, as you might have known, that was that last message was not meant for you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me read that without fucking it up. <laughs> so here's the... 
Here's a, here's a text to Vince where Mick's trying to make it right. Vince, as you might have known, that last message was not meant for you. Dot, 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 Mick. <laughs> Dude, you can, oh, see, this man. is the kind of shit when you and me and Brian Pelman were traveling. It was just, it was ridiculous. When, when, when we started off this podcast last week, I left off. I wanted to start talking about promos, but since we're talking about the current situation, we're talk, we just talk, talking about uh, well, I Daniel. Never gave Brian. an answer about Daniel. Yeah, I know. Here's I'm waiting to hear you, know it. you keep putting me off. Here's a kid. I mean, I remember going to him because at one point he was contemplating leaving the wrestling business to join the Peace Corps. And he said, wrestling's important, but so is making a difference. And I remember you know, not knowing him that well. I knew him a little bit from Ring of Honor. And to be honest, and I've admitted this, like I went to Vince, I went to bat for a couple guys, you know, Punk, uh, uh, Samoa Joe, and Homicide, who I thought wrestled. I'm a wrestled. big Samoa Joe fan, too. Yeah, yeah, they just didn't see that. I think one of the things Punk had going for him was that Ricky Steamboat was going to bat for him, too. Right. And I have to think that both me and Ricky have come from exact opposite sides of the wrestling spectrum both pitch in for the same guy may have helped his cause out a little bit um but daniel was a guy i brian daniels was a guy i can knew he was a great talent i didn't see him as a wwe guy so i missed the boat on him i wouldn't have predicted that for him uh but he's a good you know you know he's a really good i don't want a young man he's a good guy good like, dude he's got a good heart and I went up to him and I said, I heard you were contemplating, you know, leaving the business, you know, you know, to make a difference. And I said, if I can suggest something, try to get as far as you can in this business and then go out and make a bigger difference. And I, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, knowing the way that he lives, if the money that he did make in that short run on top, and knowing that his wife is not someone who needs a lot, you know, that breathe. I like, you know, it was funny because even when I couldn't tell them apart physically, I knew that one of them, I knew there was vast differences b between the, the two of them. And, uh, and I, 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 you know, I, when I reach out, I said, just do make sure he's, he's okay. You know, like they the business will, will roll on, you know, uh, uh, they'll find a way to to make it work, but you you only get that one shot. You know, mm -hmm. I ho I hope I hope he comes back, but I hope he doesn't come back until he's fully healed. And uh, I think that spot will still be there. I mean, he's got going to have to fight for it. He's going to gonna have to fight for it, but yeah. and also just the crowd moving along as it has. You know, sometimes just the window yeah, yeah, the can window slide can... closed a little Steve, bit. Steve, one thing I don't I sometimes I'll drive down the road and I'll wonder like why was that window so open for me. And and I, and I, you have uh, uh, J, J J Dillon, um, you know I call, I I call him J J F and Dillon in my book, which is really out of frustration towards Vince because J J was the the guy who would get on the phone with me once a year and in less than twenty seconds tell me the company wasn't looking for talent. And then I'd turn on Raw and I'd see Mantar and <laughs> you did, did yeah. the, and I, well, What the, are you saying, Mantar? Wasn't a great gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> and JJ, like he phrased it particularly well, and that like it was almost like he. And this is when JJ was running talent relations yeah, at yeah. WWF. But when he wrote his book, he said that I, you know, Mick was fortunate to have been near the top of that wave, or you know, it was like he was he was calling me out on the fact that I benefited from the era I was in. And that, you know, there was this huge wave. And I just said a couple of days ago, like, all right, I wasn't Richie or, or, or Fonzie. And you can argue among yourselves who, who, whether you or The Rock was rich, but you were the, yeah. the main guys. But everyone remembers Anson Williams, yeah. you know, and Donnie Most because they were the sidekicks. Yeah. They never starred in their own show, yeah, but they were, yeah. But they were over because they were there with right. bots, with with Richie and the Fonz, and that's the way. I, I mean, I, I never saw myself as being at the top of the wave, but I mean, when that thing crashed down, you know, it was like every, you know, I didn't understand that everyone would remember that era we were in so well. But you brought in uh, two names a while ago when we were talking Poxy about and Ralph? Uh, Daniel Bryant. No, I put the wing. We'll talk about those guys. <laughs> You, you you brought up Ziggler and Punk. Let's talk about Punk because he's gone. Yeah. Will he come back? Can he come back? Does he want to come back? Does he give a shit? I don't know. You know, and he always, everyone comes back. Uh, if there's an exception to the rule, yeah. it would be him. But the secret for, for Punk, and, and I honestly, yeah, I haven't talked to him. The last time uh, I had an interaction with him was the night of the Rumble. And he said he might not be back. 
and he didn't show up. I, he's got to find something he loves as much as this because, you know, it's really hard to replace. You know, I don't know if he's got, if he's got that in his life, he doesn't need to come back. He's made all the money he's ever going to need. Uh, I don't know if he's going to get the itch. You know, you don't get to be as good as Punk was without loving it. And if you if you love it, there's really only one place to be. You there. Know? Yeah, there. Unless he wants to just be the guy who makes an absolute killing on the, I know, on the, on the independent scene and, uh, and, and working comic book conventions and, you know, making a, a handsome living that way. Interesting spot that he's in. Because are you totally fed up with the way things are being done that you remove yourself from the whole picture? Because if it's what you love, and I know he loves the business, I'm not yeah. speaking for him, and talk to him in a year. Yeah. How do you take yourself out of the equation? I did, well, you know, when I got yeah. a gut full and took my ball and went home, I've talked about that a million times. So, but, you know, Jim Ross sent me a card in the mail and I jumped at the chance to come back and, uh, you know, get it while I could. You got to make uh, hay while the sun shines. He, he ain't making hay right now. You can only make hay so long. You know, I says I don't believe I've ever shared this. Um, when I was about, you know, I was in making the decision to do the thing with Ambrose before the the doctor stepped in and told me that I uh, I'd had my last match, and uh, that that grassroots thing was really uh, resonating with the top guys in the company. Punk, you know, Cena, they they liked it. It was different. And uh, and and Punk wanted he wanted to be a part of it. And I remember parking outside an arena and uh, uh, texting him. And I said, uh, I said, how how how? I didn't know exactly how old he was. He was twelve years younger than me. I said, twelve years from now, do you envision yourself coming back after a three year layoff to do a segment that is intentionally bad, referring to me coming back to do the This Is Your Life, John Cena. Spot. And he said, no. And I said, well, that will give you some indication of how far I've fallen from my, you know, my ideals. Like, right. and, and I will always regret that I let myself, you know, that I, that I let myself fall that far and that I, I didn't, I didn't stand up and fight that one. You know, as I get the call, it is a pretty unusual idea. And under other circumstances, if I'd been back a while, I would have been glad to have done a segment that was purposely bad. bad. If I remember correctly, I would go out there and say, watch this, Steve. And then I would tank an interview just so you could tell me Jock Lanza's, you know, reaction yeah. backstage. Yeah. And I, you come back and you go, that was awful. I, you know, it was a masterpiece. But my first time back to be uh, in a segment that was intentionally bad was a real... Uh, it was a real, it was a real blow to everything that I thought I had stood for, and I remember Punk, you know, saying he was, he he wouldn't be that guy, right? And uh, I don't know if he's going to come back if it's less than ideal, and if he does come back, if he's just if he becomes that guy he hated, you know, like right. if he becomes that part time guy collecting the big check, then he 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 gets the last laugh, but he does it at the expense of his ideals. Mm. Pretty heavy stuff for a Pretty, wrestling guy. Huh? Dang. Look, before we talk about promos, <laughs> which I said we were going to talk about 20 minutes ago, you brought up one other name, Ziggler. Talented cat. Your thoughts on him? You like him, right? I do like him. I don't know. Uh, you know You know what, Steve? I think Dolph, it's a, it's a different world, you know, with all the honesty and the Internet, and, you know, you kind of shoot straight with your fans. And I don't know sometimes if he knows where to draw the line between the character and the guy. And somebody said, watch, watch at real Mick Foley's expression. And this was um, at uh, the Comic-Con uh, two, two, probably two years ago, or maybe it was a year ago. It was a year. And uh, Dolph, they asked how you move up the card. And he goes, well, you know, you, you, you try to work your best with this guy. You try to have the best match you get with this guy. And then maybe end up taking John Cena's five moves. And the expression I went was the, Ooh. yeah, it's like, don't. You do, and it's not that John's a vindictive guy, but no one likes to be. No top guy likes to be spoken of that way. Right. And I believe you may have had an issue if one of the guys on the ladder had spoken of you that way. You know? Well, I mean, it's true. I mean, I only had about three or four moves, not even five. So I mean, giving Cena credit for five is an incredible compliment. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I don't think you want to speak like that. Uh, and, and and speaking of John, I mean, dude, that guy's had a hellacious run. He, yeah. And he's probably still right in the middle of it. I think he's got another five, six years left in him. And he's going to go down as one of the greatest champions of all time. And that's the straight-up shoot from, from Steve Austin. So I got nothing but respect for him. But with Ziggler, 
I don't really know what or who Adolf Ziegler is. And I've talked to him at a couple of the functions and Make-A-Wish things at L.A. a couple of years ago when WWE came to town. And, and I like the guy. I love his work. Uh, I'd like to see him a little more physical in the ring. I'd like to uh, see him establish a go-to hold. Yeah. I'd like to see a little bit more offense from him. And I don't mean offense in, this, in the uh, vein of a high spot. Offense and in, in, in working an arm and punishing a guy. Yeah, your job is, you know, baby face, you know, heel's going to make you look good. You shine, maybe out wrestling, get a little bit of heat, feel sorry for him. You come back, you know, high spot or two, go home, and it is what it is where the finish is. But he just needs to establish himself a little bit more and be a little bit more dominant in the ring. And, uh, you know, a cunt hair stronger, stronger, I dare say. Yeah, you heard it, Mick, a cunt hair stronger. I can say that on the Steve Austin show, Unleashed, because that's what it is. No, your, your thoughts on my critique. Uh, I, you know, I, I like uh, like your viewpoint. I think, you know, as wonderful as he is in the ring, there is uh, the sense that he is going to put on a great show every night. Uh, and and I, th- I think sometimes you need to be able to suspend his belief to where you understand you're not watching a, a great show. I think he would have got he would have gotten there. He was on the right road, and somebody pulled the plug. Sometimes Jack check his – I call Jack Mick. I mean, yeah, Mick, right. Jack, whatever. I mean, God dang, we've known each other for 93, <laughs> 4. 89? Well, I mean, 89, 89. but yeah, then yeah, we but start yeah, traveling yeah, together. Yeah, 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 But it, it, it's a real interesting story. I guess uh, DDP, someone, maybe Jake told me the story, but when Jake was brought in to WWF by Vince, and Jake's going out, he's trying to have good matches with everybody, right? You yes. think that's the right thing to yes. do, yeah. have a good match with yeah. everybody. He wasn't getting over. Finally, Vince pulls him aside and says, what are you doing? And Jake says, what do you mean? I'm trying to have good matches. He goes, I didn't bring you in here to get good matches out of you. I brought you in to get over. Meaning you got to get over, then go have those good matches with right. everybody. Yeah. Because then you can draw some money. Well, and sometimes, I mean, you know, that's a road that I never really had to go down, and everybody finds their way a different way. And I think it's going to be from him taking more than giving more in the ring. And sometimes, I mean, it's, it's a 50-50, a 60-40, you know 70-30. Most, you can place a percentage on it. One of the most uncomfortable matches I ever had, and Sean Waltman will tell you the same thing. And they're hard matches. Is, is when I thought I needed to look strong to work with Hunter, and he wanted to have a good match. And it was like, I like this guy. I respect this guy. I completely understand where he's coming from, but I strongly feel like I need this and it's really hard, you know. It's it's hard. To it is if you don't have that in your personality, and I don't. I hate to be a selfish guy in the ring, but sometimes you gotta. You just gotta. And, and sometimes you need that agent to step in and say, you know what? Here's what we need. <laughs> and this is the conversation we had last week when the weight got taken off your shoulders and yeah, mine to yeah, ride off yeah, in the sunset. Yeah. Sometimes you need that agent to just come in and say, look, you and I. Hey, listen, Mick. We need Steve at about 70, 80% yeah. in this match. You understand? And that I leaves remember, you 20 to 30. I remember when Jerry Briscoe was there for me when I debuted the day after WrestleMania with Bob Holly. And Bob's a tough son of a gun. Yep. And Bob wanted to get his stuff in. And uh, and Jerry was there to let Bob know that I had to get over. You know, I right. needed to get over. And I told him I would gladly repay him at an, another time. That's what I was saying, not a knock, knock on Sean. It's just you saying... When you're up there, you have these very difficult decisions to make, and sometimes you need to look good. One of the biggest moments, defining moment in my career took place in Japan when I had Shoji Nakamaki underneath. Say that three of, times <laughs> fast. Shoji, Shoji Nakamaki, known to ICP fans as Lama Namanumi. <laughs> Say that five times <laughs> Lama fast. Lama Namanumi. <laughs> And I had him underneath the bed of nails, and I knew I was going to drop an elbow on him. And it's my instinct as a pretty kind and benevolent human being to take care of the man underneath that bed of nails. And I just had this, like, it was like the the, the scene in Animal House with the devil and the angel. The angel saying, <laughs> don't, don't you dare drop that elbow as hard as you can. And the devil pops up, you're going to make this son of a bitch look good. And it was like a moment, like I re- just remember, I didn't think I had a sadistic bone in my body, and I came down pretty hard with that elbow, and I heard him screaming underneath those nails. Was he screaming or just selling? He was screaming. <laughs> it was caught in his head. He was like, he was watching, like, trying to dig nails out of his head. And I just remember thinking, like, that's pretty cool. And I didn't know I had that. 
I really didn't know I had that. And I made it a point when I wrestled Randy Orton in, in 2004 to find those matches in Japan. And I cut the promo where I, it wasn't that match. It was specifically a, ma a different match where uh, Rick Patterson, big guy from uh, Edmonton, had uh, it was either Nakamaki or uh, Ono, another one of the, the baby faces there for IWA Japan in a backbreaker, and I had that barbed wire wrapped around my, my arm, and I came off with that elbow, and Patterson, you know, gave him the, the, the little flip, and it, it looked like dynamite, and I looked up at that camera and gave it the, the bang, bang, and when I saw that, I'd like watch it back, and I'd rewind it, and I'd be like, on the surface, I would tell myself, I'm here in IWA Japan because I'm a father with two kids and I have a mortgage to pay. <laughs> I'd watch that back, and I'd be like, there's part of me that does not hate being here. You know, there's part of me that really thrives on being here, not just taking the punishment, but giving it out a little bit. And when I came back to WWE, I had that experience and I knew what it felt like and I knew what was necessary to get over. And I was able to use those lessons that I experienced and to assert myself in those situations when I needed to get over, you know, and, and I'm being honest, like, you know, in, no one's got the great Mick Foley badass story. There's no stories about me taking on eight guys in a bar. You right. know? But I would stand up for what I thought was right, and I would risk taking a beating for it. You know, if I thought it was right for business, I would I would gladly stick up for my right to look good in that ring. Can Dolph Ziggler get over? Yes. He just needs someone to believe in him and give him the chance and state the goals cleanly. If say you were in that dressing room, you'd say for two weeks they make you and the, his agent, and you spell it out to him. Right. And if he's listening to this podcast, right. And and it would hurt me because I like Dolph, and Dolph like as an entertainer, Dolph goes on his off nights and does comedy on you know unpaid, unbilled guest sets. Like he's going to be good at everything he does, whether it's amateur wrestling and and you know building up that <clears throat> stellar career or having matches that are state-of-the-art in our business. But when my 11-year-old goes, this is a great match, but Dolph Ziggler is going to lose because he's Dolph Ziggler, there's a problem. Right. And I, I think if he was able, honestly, he he needs somebody to, to be willing to put that plug back in and give him I think a it's chunk. a bit more offense. I think it's establishing a, a, not just one go-to hold, but just establishing a hold. One time we were going down the road. We're going to take a break right after this. We're going to talk about promos. One more story from the road. Myself and Paul Orndorff, Mr. Wonderful, yeah. used to travel down the road in, in uh, WCW for a period of time. And he had worked with Paul Roma that night before, I guess, they put him in a tag team together. And a pretty good tag team. But anyway, there they were working a single. And Paul Roma's a very athletic guy, good drop kick, uh, arm drag, can work. And of course, Paul Orndorff, Paul Orndorff, you know, always gets good heat, right, yeah. shine a guy up, just trademark, straight ahead, good hand. Yeah. Heel or baby, better as a heel. And then I'll tell you what, I saw him grab a damn arm bar on Paul Roma, and he just stood over him. Paul was seated. Pa Paul Roma was seated. Paul Orndorff was standing, good deep arm bar, and just pulling on that arm, and it just represented power. It was a house show. The lights were what they were, so it was better lighting than TV. It wasn't yeah. too bright. And it really resonated with me. And so we were driving down the road. And I said, man, that's a badass match you had with Paul Roma. I said, you know what was my favorite part of the match? He goes, let me think. And he went about two or three miles down the road. He was driving. He goes, it's when I had that arm bar on him. How do you know? I said, how do you know? He goes, this is exactly from Paul, uh, one, this is exactly from Paul Orndorff's lips. He goes, because it was power. He goes, you knew I had control of him. It was power. And I said, I guess you're right, because it, it resonated with me. And it was just the picture of who was in control right there at that time and who was dominant. So, anyway, segue out of that. We're going to take a little pause for the calls and come back and finally. Talk about promos. Talk about promos. Mick, can you cut a promo? Oh, heck yeah. All right, we're coming back with Mick Foley. Talk promos, uh, word from our sponsors. You're listening to another classic episode of the Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. Do you own a home or condo? Or perhaps you run a house or apartment? Sure you do. And GEICO knows it can be hard work. Because whether you own or rent, you still have to fill it full of your stuff. Your furniture, the flat screen, and all the boxes of stuff that have been sitting there ever since you moved in, but have it unpacked. It's hard to find the time, right? But you know what's easy? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowner's or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. 
That way, you'll rest easy knowing that your home and all your stuff is protected, like the furniture and that flat screen. Plus, getting a quote on homeowners and renters insurance is super easy through GEICO. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. You know, like going through all those boxes of stuff. Visit GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. Steve Austin, Unleashed. Unleashed. All right, here we are. 30 minutes ago when we started this show, we were going to talk about promos, and we're finally doing that. You talk about a lying son of a bitch. I thought this whole hour was going to be dedicated <laughs> about the promo, but we can hammer it for 30 minutes. Yes, we can. So coming up in school, short answers, good student, bad student. Underachiever. I didn't become a good student in college until I started wrestling and had a, a focus, and then I became a very good college student. Smart or dumb? Very smart. I was. Smart. I always give you credit for being one of the smartest guys I've ever met in history of business. You better not fuck this up. <laughs> yeah, man. I was. I was. I was. I was so, what were you majoring in? A communications major. You know, I was uh, radio and TV, and that really came into. They yeah. teach you the rap there. What, what do they teach you when you do when you're a radio TV person? Because I wish I would have yeah. majored in this. Man, I was. A, I was an editing machine. Now I can't edit at all. Technology. But it wasn't on camera really stuff. It was behind the scenes. It was. I would do on cameras too. You know, okay. I was. I was even when I was a teacher assistant. I was very happy to be on camera. I'm mean, up here in the students' projects. Yeah, I was actually, okay, so then in your college career or growing up, extrovert, introvert. I was an introvert who liked to get reactions as a performer. So then once that camera come on, you're yeah. ready to go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thrived on. It was never the competition. It was always about getting the reaction, which is why I've been able to make that really nice segue and get that same feeling of fulfillment from doing my shows that I used to get in the ring. They're different reactions, but I realized like in 99 as the lighter hearted mankind, you know, it took me a while to accept that a laugh could be as valuable as a wince. You know, it took me a while to accept that my job was to send people home happy and not necessarily just concerned or, or disturbed. But like late 80s, early 90s, I wanted people to be I wanted to, I wanted to strike fear into the hearts of people. Yeah. So then what was your mindset when you developed that first, uh, as I remember your promos in world class, that Cactus Jack promo? I mean, it was just kind of like, you know, the voice. Yeah. Higher pitched. Right. Intense. Hell been on a mission, not not a deep deeply layered uh, promo that you would go on to right. cut in ECW yeah. or WWF. So, what was the genesis of the promo as far as Cactus Jack speaking to the universe? Genesis of the promo was just to have something in your mind, and I think that's where the guys today are being underserved by the scripted promo. And I've said this before, oh, and they're just they're just they're being denied. The freedom and the ability to have fun and create. And the, and Go the, ahead. Pre, and the necessity and pressure of driving down the road and being in, ca you know, driving down the road in character. This, the, the, the promo that suffers is not the one that day that somebody's writing for you because they might write a heck of a promo for you. The promo that suffers is the promo a month down the line, a year down the line for the rest of your career because you're not feeling it. And or the, growing. The guys who do feel it stand out. Like a, like a, a Bray Wyatt, a Dean Ambrose, they they stand out because I'd be surprised if they're not having a lot of say in 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 the words they speak. But other guys, you can see them trying to recite, and it's not the same. It doesn't mean you can't take someone else's verbiage and make it your own. And people have won Academy Awards for doing that. But I like to be the guy who could respond to anything. Jake Roberts last night, I was privileged to have Jake on the stage during the Q&A, and Jake talked about the days when you do 57 promos for local towns, and you were there when that was uh, you know, still part of the job description. And you could be the guy who just did the same promo 57 times for different cities. You could be the guy who tried to do something different each time. And so I'll give, you know, I'll give credit to, a lot of credit to DDP. Uh, I didn't know when I, when I returned to WCW in 1991 that I was essentially just supposed to be one of these guys who's a progression of guys who would be fed to Sting to try to get, you know, to heat him up a little bit. You know, he'd been logged down with two or three opponents for right. quite a while. Nobody told me that was a job description. You know, I, I was told I was coming in and work with Sting. I thought I was coming in as a top guy. 
And I didn't know that they had this six-week run in mind for me. And Dallas apparently went to Dusty while I was cutting. Pro- I still remember, you know, like like I said, you got 57 things. And I was talking about how I couldn't go to, you know, I was having trouble falling asleep. So I started counting all the different ways that I could injure Sting. I finally fell asleep at 427. I hadn't even gotten to his legs yet. <laughs> and uh, Dallas went to Dusty Rhodes and said, you got to come down here and take a look at this guy. That's and great. If I just had the one promo, all right, Montgomery, boy, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to teach you a lesson, you know, 30 seconds, Montgomery. Well, let me tell you something, you know, I had something in my mind, you know, on the, all the time thinking about these, these things so that when I finally did get the chance, it was like release. And I benefited a lot from the frustration I, I, I felt, especially over the years. And especially when I got to WC, when I got to ECW, and knew what it was like, and I always talk, and I talk about that. I always talk, I say, you, "Me, you," and then I throw Dustin as well, and I say, "There was this, you know, this sense of frustration that you there was a glass ceiling, and they were staying up there in that top floor, and there were three or four other guys knocking and going." We'd like to know what it's like to be up there too. And then I would talk about how because I didn't have that, I have to gauge how well my career was going by how often I was recognized at the Waffle House. And yeah. then it leads into a funny story about encountering uh, you know, a guy who's taking wrestling way too seriously. But if I didn't have that frustration and I go out and say you were in the same boat when I went to ECW, everything had been fine and I'd been treated the, well, the way that I thought I should have, I don't think I could have cut those promos in ECW. And I don't mean to pick on the guy, and I've since apologized, and I've come to learn that the only thing I've ever had against him is that he was making a lot of money at a time when I wasn't. Is it, Without Mark Merrill, I'm not sure if either you or I would have really made it in WWE because he was that guy. You saw about a guy who had a target on his back. He was yeah. like, he came in three days after Vince looked at me and said, we don't give guarantees in WWE, I'll say E, you know. We uh, we give opportunities, and three days later, in comes Mark Merrill with the first ever guaranteed contract. And maybe I was happy to be in WWE, and I was smiling on the outside, but deep down, there was a sense of purpose. And I remember you and I going out at, as a heel match in 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 '96, early '97, and tearing it down, just tearing it down, calling stuff on the spot. We didn't realize why we went five you know five minutes over is because. The match was so good, WCW went into a break, and they knew we could carry the ball. But I think the sense that we both had is we're going to show these guys that they picked the wrong guy to give a contract to. And uh, I, do, I honestly, I mean, from a, uh, an emotionally stable standpoint, I'd like to be able to say I could have cut the same promos if I'd been happy and emotionally healthy but i was frustrated i was angry and i had a way of letting that out in my promo but where'd the back end of that promo come from when you raised the pitch is that the frustration because you talk about and i haven't even got to his legs yet because that's when you pitch it up yeah well part there was also what there was a sense of fun in doing it you know there i i enjoyed that and i enjoyed the performance but what, what, part. but what what got you down that uh path of thinking i mean <laughs> and was it a movie i mean was it anybody's character uh, you know, it was talking to guys like Robert Fuller, and it was t- talking to guys like Jimmy Cornette who believed in me, and it was watching some of the guys, and, and it was, you know, borrowing a little bit from Terry Funk, borrowing right. a little bit, even though he wasn't known to be a great promo, borrowing a little bit from Terry Gordy, borrowing a little bit of the animation from Jimmy Snuka. I like the honesty of Terry Gordy. He told you how it was, like it yeah, was, yeah. as it was, yeah, and uh, and straight at you, both barrels. I love Robert Fuller's promos. Man, guy's highly unheralded. Of course, you know Jim Cornette was a mile a minute, yeah. a blue streak, and never repeat anything at the same time uh, twice. So I loved his promos, but they're all different from yours. Yeah. So, and uh, when did you, when you got to ECW, it started cut, cutting all that multi layered shit. What was the thinking behind that? I thought my time had come and gone. I really did. I really thought my time had come and gone, and uh, that I was going to be the guy destined to, uh, you know, make a living bleeding uh at one point um i don't know if you know this but uh i i i went to paul Heyman and i told him that uh i was gonna go see if i could uh start working for wcw on monday nights as a as like more or less a glamorized enhancement guy right and he said why do you want to do that 
And I said, because I think with ECW, WCW, and the work I'm doing in Japan, I could put together a pretty decent living for myself. He said, you don't, you don't think you have what it takes to be in WWE? I said, I, I know I don't. And Paul, he sat me down and he said, you might think I'm crazy. He said, but if you're willing to listen to me and let me guide you within one year, you're going to get that call from WWE. He said, you might think I'm crazy, but within five years, you're going to be world heavyweight champion. And he looked me, I'll never forget it. He said, you might think I'm completely out of my mind, but 19 years from now, my client, Brock Lesnar. <laughs> All right, that part of it didn't happen. But he we, did. we, we were watching Monday Night uh, Raw a while ago. When Mick Foley wa walked in, I DVR'd Monday Night Raw, so I took it back to the Paul Heyman uh, promo so he could see it because he cut such a badass promo. But anyway, so when Paul pulled you aside and told you that, what are you thinking? You full of shit or did you believe in him? I remember him telling me he couldn't, couldn't do that. I can't remember if he said I couldn't. He wouldn't advise it. He thought that there were, he saw more potential in me as a player than I did. I mean, when I was giving those promos about Tommy Dreamer, the one you know, you you came in and we're we're, li we're listening to, you know, where I talk about you know how I, I may have burned my bridge. It's not too late for you. I mean, I really felt like I was like the Jacob Marley of professional wrestling, like a guy who had kids, made a made a bad decision. Left, uh, you know, left this job with the the six figure income, left the two kids hanging. So now I could go to Japan and get blown up and stitched up and come to ECW where I did have that sense of frustration. I mean, you, you remember JT Smith? Yeah. Uh, you know, he. Yeah, I mean, he, he, there you could let the f bombs fly, and I and I did it very seldomly. But I mean, I, I don't think there was a, a any. Any question, I was being 100% honest when I talked about J.T. Smith slipping off the top rope and his head, his head just, you know, just it sw swelled instantly. And those fans started chanting, you know, you effed up, you effed up. And I looked at the camera and I said, you effed up? Fuck you. You know, like, who are you? Like, who? there was a sense, like, how, like, how, you know, how, how dare you tell us what to do? And then, you know, any guy who left was accused of selling out. And I knew then that there wasn't going to be anybody taking up, you know, charity drives for somebody who couldn't make his house payment. And so I definitely had this sense that, uh, you know, of almost desperation. You know, I was being completely honest uh, when I was cutting those promos about Tommy Dreamer. But in the back of my head, you know, there was that element of hope that Paul had put in me that, you know, if uh, that there was maybe something else. To be, but I always thought it was going to be another possible run. When did you stepping. know you was laying down heavy promos? When I left, when I left that house, uh, because you know, yeah, right. You know when you're floundering, yeah. You know when you're just flapping your gums. Yeah. I've been there, I've done it, but yeah. I know when I felt them, and I knew when I was sure making money. It was uh, we went to I think it was Ron Ron Buffon, the cameraman, you know, whose house we'd go to, and we'd cut the promos in the basement. And I cut the three promos in a row. Uh, it was uh, the Uncle Willie promo, and and it uh, there was a, a second promo, and then the famous Kane Dewey promo. Yeah. Cut them. I dropped. I had my kids and my wife. I dropped them off at the park. I came back to pick them up like an hour later. And I felt like I was like a different man. Like I, I'm in complete control. You know, like I can do this. I didn't know if I'd ever get the chance to do it on a major level again. But I realized that I was, you know, like in, you know, like some rare air there with the ability to. Now, how long would you, did you think about these? I mean, because I would imagine you would put a little bit of thought, but I would imagine you just going with the flow. 70%. I, I would th thought. I never wrote them down. I remember, right. you know, as, as nice as it was that Joey said I showed off my skills as a writer, I never wrote anything down. Not even a, not even a phrase. It was all going to, going down the road. The car was always like my, uh, you know, my uh, uh, my play. think tank. Yeah, it was like my think tank. Yeah, to this day, it's the only place where I listen to music, and I would. I mean, I'd listen to those songs, and I'd see these images, you know, come alive in my head, and uh, especially as I as I got older and realized that you know that that I. The moment when I started thinking good enough was good enough, I realized I'd lost the you know the, the race that uh, I wasn't who I wasn't somebody I could be proud of anymore. You know, like I liked being that guy. You know, who whose whose biggest 
um, obstacle was taking the images that were so real to me in my head and making them come to life the next night in a promo or making them come to life in a match the next month. You know, they were very real, very real to me. And there was times when I had to struggle to try to translate that and bring it alive in the ring, especially given, you know, like the, you know, the limited physical hand I had. And that's where, you know, showing up to work with guys like you and guys like Taker and guys like Rock and guys like Hunter really helped because I was able to take these ideas, share them, have somebody like like a Shawn Michaels at Mind Games in 96 say, okay, I'm drained, I'm exhausted, do you have anything? Here you go. Here's right. 26 minutes worth of stuff I've got on my mind, you know, and have him go, wow, you know, wow, not only is that great, but you're looking out for me and you're going to try to make me look as good as you possibly can while getting over yourself, which was always the goal. So I couldn't have done it without the, the guys, you know, that I had. I think... I don't think it's exaggerating to say we had the best possible, you know, equation there with so many guys coming into their own at the same time. In ECW? In ECW Man, and then into, w, into WWE. But let's stick, with, it. Let's stick with ECW because sure. Shane Douglas was laying down some heavy promos. Yeah, yeah. His tone, and, and he would cover material as well, but his, his tone, his demeanor, it was condescending and – Mean spirited and dominant, and I loved his promo. It was straightforward. Yeah, yeah. meat and potatoes, and he, he's a little bit arrogant. Yeah, uh, so I really dug his promos. Uh, Raven, hell of a damn promo. Yeah, I really enjoyed Raven's promos. And some of the best promos I cut were with Raven. Right. And as great as he was, one of his strengths was when he saw me on a roll. He was it last night, for example. We do the Q and A. It's my show. My instinct is to try to close it. I usually have a closing story. You know, I don't rely on the last question to dictate, like, how well the show ends. But I'm like, you know what? I've got Jake. I've got Jim. I'm going to close with a story, and then we're going to go to the Q&A, and we're just going to hope for the best. And a question comes Jake's way, and he hits it out of the park. And I'm and I'm actively thinking to myself, do I try to grab the microphone, and do I try to get a last laugh? Or do I just accept that Jake is, that in the end, people are going to walk away with a huge smile on their face, and the better Jake is, the better people remember my show as being. Right. And Jake finished his story, he handed me the mic, and I said, thank you so much, everyone. And I was really proud of the fact that I didn't, you know, I didn't fight it. I just right. went with it, and there, there was no better closer. So in that respect, R Raven probably did the same thing. All right, this guy's really rolling. This is part of our promo, and and then he would like you know I'd finish and Raven would just hit that pose and it would be, that's powerful. You brought up Jake Snake Roberts. Were you at the Hall of Fame this past year? I was. Yeah. Yeah, we talked. Yeah. Jesus Christ, yeah. I'm an idiot. Too many steel chairs, and you got hit with more than I did. <laughs> Question: You remember Jake's uh, acceptance speech yes. at the Hall of Fame? Yeah. Stole the show. Yeah. Jesus Christ, that was one of the best promos I've ever heard. Yeah. You remember it? I uh, yeah uh, yeah well hell. We masturbate people's emotions. Yeah. Great line. Great but just, line. I mean, he started off, and, and then he, you know, he pulled your heartstrings, and then he took you deep. Yeah. And it, it like, kind of scared you a little bit, and like, God damn, it's so much, about half crazy. And, and then pulled your heartstrings some more, got some heat, and then come up. It was like, God, it was, it was the best. I really thought it was the best Hall of Fame speech I've ever heard. It was great. Uh, you know, at the time, you know, it's unfortunate at the time, you know, Warriors right. passed. At the time, my thought was that Jake should have gone on last because he had the best story to tell. Right. Um, and uh, and that was why I made the little public tweet, which obviously I – and I'm, I'm glad to say that I was asked the night before Jim or Warrior died, like, what did I think of his of his promo? And I said, you know, I went back. I thought I talked about it with Brian Gewertz. I said – there's a lot of good stuff in there. You know, like if you take little sections of it, it was really powerful. And I thought it was a good promo. And then I was really happy that when uh, Warrior was out there for that last uh, promo that the camera panned and there was a Foley in the front row. My daughter was in the front row and she was cheering. So she was representing me in the respect that I should have shown Warrior that night. Well, you know, I've always said this, you know, when they made the uh, destruction of the Ultimate Warrior DVD, you know, whatever it was, there was some heat there, whatever, and it finally got washed away, and everybody was, was cool right there at 30. 
But I always thought that the Warriors promos fit him, and they were perfect for his character and his persona, and they didn't have to make sense. No, I yeah. mean, you know, but you believe it. Here, here's the thing. It's like I've always said, and, 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 and I've said it was with, with Arn, and you've probably been there. Ron Simmons can go out there and say the ABCs and scare the shit out of you, and you believe it. Because he's got that tone, and he's yeah. Ron Simmons. Everybody yeah. knows how bad he is. Yeah. He's one of the sweetest guys in the world. <laughs> yeah. But that's how serious right. you take Ron that's Simmons when he. What well, take? Remember when he he used to be the uh, what was Farouk, and they put him in that silly light blue, blue outfit, helmet. and he had that helmet called the Skullbuster. Well, that's what we called it behind. Who would know? All these years later, I got an obstacle course named a Skullbuster. <laughs> but that's what we call that blue helmet. But nobody ever laughed at Ron because he was such a badass. We laughed. Behind this, but, yeah, but you know, <laughs> now, now if it had been you or me that wore that outfit, we'd we'd be getting shredded. But Warriors promos fit his gimmick, and and they furthered his I'll cause. Give, I'll give you an example. I I mentioned when you talk about the promos that I leaned on, and I said Terry Funk, which right. everyone can understand. I said Terry Gordy, which you can understand. But when you say Jimmy Snooker, it was like, well, Snooker was a terrible promo guy. I was like, no, no, he wasn't. He wasn't because you believed him. You know, even when he, I mean, I remember to this day, you know, the cage match. Same Part of the with reason, the Warrior, dude. Yeah, Same principle. It wasn't, you know, uh, uh, phonetically right. a marvelous promo. But part of the reason I, I hitchhiked to the garden. I remember, I remember the promo. He goes, brother, let me tell you something about that cage. You can break a bone. And I'm talking about any part of a bone. Like, it didn't matter that he yeah. messed it up. It was like it was that intensity and right. the delivery, and you didn't get the sense right. that anybody was feeding him or anybody right. wrote down. I mean, you can break there. any part of a boat. boat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, and it was like I need I need to be there, and uh, that's why I, you know I'll talk with a guy. Like I asked you earlier, if, you know how tight you were with Roddy. Not you don't don't know you know know that well. Uh, guys like Roddy and Dusty. Uh, Midnight Express, uh, Rock and Roll Express, who got over everywhere, you know, and especially the heels like Roddy, who had to talk people into a building, and Dusty as a largely as a baby, almost entirely as a baby face, but went then did it, day, you know, year in and year out, change of change of scenery, still talking people into the building. It's still uh, it's 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 changed. It's more about entertaining people, but in the end, you know, I still think there's something to be said for that killer promo, which is why, even though we don't have the buy rates like we used to to gauge the interest, like this SummerSlam right. is going to be hot, largely because of some great promo work by 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 Paul. And I, I'll I'll go a step further and say answered by Cena because a while ago I showed you the Paul Heyman promo. I didn't show you the Cena return. Yeah. Cena delivered. And a lot of time he goes over that same old bubblegum bullshit and it's a repeat uh, about passion. Yeah. But man, the dude when he's when he when he goes out there a little bit and gets intense and delivers a message, he's an A one promo and when he's I'll, returning. And I'll say fire. That. I mean I remember, you know, when I was fairly new to Twitter and I didn't have, you know, the numbers that was, you know, that fortunately stacked up. But I was in living in Florida at the time, and I sent out. So I, he gave one of those promos, and I said, "Man, great promo by at John Cena. I think it's about time people recognize his legacy of great matches in WWE." And I just, I looked over at my daughter, and I went, "I, I just got 800 messages." She was, "But you sent that out a minute ago." And I said, "Well, let me try it again." I said. Oh, yeah, you know, <laughs> try to find a, a bad at John Cena pay-per-view match for me. And like 900 people answered back, we're watching it. And they all had the one match. And I said, if everyone's pointing to one match, it's a pretty good indication that he's had a run of great matches. He's had the, he's had, uh, he's had the opponents. And I said, it reminded me, in my, my high school had the winningest lacrosse program in the country. And there were people in the community who thought that this coach, Joe Cuzo, didn't know how to coach, that he compiled 700 wins by having the right talent every year right. for 39 years. You know, it's right. completely ridiculous. You know, and guys said, well, he had the right talent. I was like, what about that match with great college? You know, either, yeah. and it, it was the first time I'd had a negative backlash. By and large, up to that point, it was people who were agreeing with what I had to say. And when I came back to WWE for one of my occasional stops, and John pulled me aside and he just said, "Thank you, 
And that's all. That's all he said. I knew exactly what he was talking right. about. And I just said, "You, John." I said, "You know, like, I feel like I'm, I'm entitled to, you know, like I, I don't think wrestling's history should be written solely by the the fans. Like, I think I have a say as well. And I right. felt like that needed to be said. But you're right. When he's on his, when he's on his game, he's as he's as good as anyone. Talking to the legend Mick Foley, we're talking about all kinds of bullshit here today on the show. I'll take a pause for the calls of a word from my sponsors. Coming right back with the one and only Mick Foley. You're listening to another classic episode of the Steve Austin Show, only on Podcast One. All right, coming back with Mick Foley. Real quickly, you know, we're going we're gonna to draw this, this hour in, uh, Mick. Let me ask you a question. We've been talking about some promos and going back to your ECW days. I saw a, a DVD a documentary called ECW Barbed Wire City. Did you see this? I haven't seen it yet. Man, it was just uh, it was kind of a deal where, to me, the glass was half empty. And guys just went in there and come out of meat grinder. and beat up, fucked up, and on pills and dope and just in a bad way. Yeah. Uh, you came out. You were there for shit. How long? I was there for a year and a half. You made it out okay. Yeah. Uh, I was there. I came in, and Polly gave me a call on a tour tricep, got fired by WCW. I came in. I wasn't there very long. Uh, dress room was a wild situation. Yeah. And people were doing different things. And I hooked up with a couple of guys and was doing certain things. Uh, it was an interesting dynamic. Uh, Going back to those promos, like, I loved my – it was a love-hate relationship. Because I realized it was a dead end street. That buying into the EC dub, EC dub, was a dead end street, and I realized that you had to get, you had to get out. You know, you if you had the chance to get out of there, you had to take it. And I never, I the you sold out chance rang so hollow to me. Right. And I think anybody who bought into them and stayed to avoid them was, you know, was 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 being delusional so some of so much of that stuff was uh pure violence some of it some of some of it was the fastest moving greatest shows i've ever seen yeah. but on the other end of it is you know diminishing returns when you go so far out you can't yeah. come back in uh and i'm very thankful to to the time i spent there to get me to the next level which was wwf but man when i when i look back it was just uh god damn it was some it was heavy duty, fast forward bullshit with a lot of violence. <laughs> yeah, it was. There were some good storylines, but yeah. it, it it was testosterone, adrenaline, straight at you. At what? At any point did you think, "Hey, shit's a little out of hand here"? <laughs> at any? Uh, yeah. Do you know what? Yes. Uh, I remember, you know, flying back from Japan with uh, uh, the Sandman, even though we worked for two different promotions. And being really hurt, you know, you're a wrestler. You're not supposed to talk about hurt feelings, but feeling hurt when he revealed how messed up he was when we had some of our best matches, and I thought that's it's disrespectful. This is a game about you know trust and respect. And uh, when I went to Paul and said that I wouldn't work with somebody who was impaired, when I showed back up in the dressing room, I was like, I'm the dick. Yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> kind of the culture there, and, yeah. and I think that was a uh, that was a a teachable moment for me. You know that when and not to the, you know if you would ask any of the ECW guys, did you turn on Mick at yeah. that point? And, you know, I don't think anyone consciously yeah. did, but I think there was a sense of like, well, who does he think he is? Yeah. Like, how? What do you mean we can't work impaired? And and for me, yeah, that was that was a sense, you know, that, that uh, you know maybe things were out of hand when when the guy trying to, you know, strike a a blow for a safer work environment was <laughs> made to feel like a dick. And hey, when, when I say I hooked up with a couple of guys before the show started, I wasn't wrestling. I was just okay, waiting until okay, yeah. the end of the show to cut a promo. So anyway, uh, and, and that being said, I'm not a saint. But to that end, never been in a ring. Uh, well, two times I was probably hammered going to the ring, but other than that, never. And I had to straight up shoot because it's here on the Steve Austin Show. Uh, question, at what point does a work environment damn near turn into a shoot when you take the barometers off the violence at hand 
you know, with all the bullshit that the foreign objects and the hardcore style matches. It, for me, that point was Royal Rumble 99. And luckily, you know. You know and you're going to say WWF rather than uh, yeah, ECW. Yeah, I think so. Um, that's the match that made me turn around. It also happened that it was, you know, documented on f film by Barry Blaustein Beyond the Mat. And I, I wasn't aware of how out of hand it had gotten until I saw my children react. Like, I, I don't know if I would have thought it was that bad, but it was... This is the match with you and the Rock. Yeah, yeah. And it was just violent. You know, it just got out of hand. And it was... What was your... Now, because here's the deal. You and the Rock have a match. Yeah. You get handcuffed, and he's going to hit you with about, what, eight Five. or ten? Five. Five, Five chair shots. Five. It seemed like a hundred when you were backstage watching. I was there, and man, I watched those first couple. And I mean, he was laying them in because he had to. Yeah, and it was agreed upon. Yeah, I didn't realize how much, how beneficial your body's ability to give. Not not taking anything away from the brutality of a chair shot, but at least when your body you can give a little bit. I didn't understand it. it's like the Cinderella song. Don't know what you got until it's gone. Once that ability was gone and my hands were cuffed behind my back and that first chair shot came and it hurt me down in my toes, like I realized this was a whole new level of pain. And my reaction to that shot was to, f like, fi fire up. You know, it was, it was a strange thing. It was a suspension of disbelief. Like, I became that character in the worst possible scenario. I became mankind, believing completely in the character with The Rock and a steel chair and my kids in the front row. And by the time we got to the agreed upon number, which was five, I'm still in the ring. You know, like I'm supposed to be two thirds of the way up the aisle. And it took 11 to get up there. And uh, so it was agreed upon five and ended up five. Being 11. Yeah, it just because they kept going on forever. When you said five while ago, I said, dude, there's more than that. And the, the mindset was at the time he was getting ready to work with you, right? Uh, for, for Mania. Right. Uh, Mania 99. Rock was really, he was um, entertaining. He was funny. And I thought we needed to show a meaner side. Like, that was my 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 job. And I wanted to make money while I did it. You know, I had right. no question about that. But I thought that's what I owed the company. That's what I owed the Rock was to reveal that 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 mean streak and we did it you right. know no question that we accomplished that and due to a unique set of circumstances you know vince wrestling for the first time in the rumble rock needing to go out and be part of that rumble me coming back and and being in rough shape rock not maybe not properly addressing the condition that i was in and thankfully like the you know the like my the the angel on my shoulder turned out to be a Scotty too hottie for alerting me that I'd been really rough on the rock in the commentary for Beyond the Mat. And to the, because if Rock had find that found that out on his own and without me telling him and giving him the heads up that I apparently had been a little rough on him in commentary, and if he hadn't gone out, you know, that day and watched it with his wife and come back and had a good talk with me, I imagine there'd be some really bad feelings and you don't want to have bad feelings towards a guy who's doing so much better in life, you know, than, than you are. What were you saying? Uh, I, I haven't, I haven't watched it back, but I know that, you know, this is where, you know, maybe if people were scripting promos for me in 99, I would have been a, a little healthier emotionally because in the back of my mind, the, the rock and sock connection you know, we were brought about with the express intent of me turning on the rock. And immediately my thought was, I'm going to go back to the way I felt that day in the ring. You know, the way I felt. But backstage. you keep saying beyond the mat, you're talking about the documentary. The documentary. I don't yeah, remember I didn't, you going crazy on a documentary. It, it was a um, special edition. Maybe okay. Five years down. Okay. It made me, I held on to this for a while. Five years, five years later, or whatever it was, where the case would be special a director's cut with me and Jesse doing commentary, um, where I, I still can't watch it. I don't want to hear what I said. But uh, Scotty came up to me, you know, and I'm pretty tight with Scotty. He was like, I watched Beyond the Mat. And I went, yeah. And he goes, you kind of buried the rock. And I went, I did? 
Like, how bad? He was like, pretty bad. And uh, so I went up. Like, that's the way I, I, I like to be, you know, is to be honest with the guy. And then he did go out, like, that day and got it. Watched it with his wife, and he was like, you were pretty tough on me, but I could have been a little more. <laughs> like, I could I, he was a little, you know, he felt bad about the way he came across. And, you know, that's the way you do things. You sit down, you talk him over. We came to a much better understanding and and were able to much better appreciate what we had done in the ring as both partners and uh, opponents. Well, take me through the 11 chair shots because, dude, watching that shit backstage uh, was brutal. And then when I watched, you know, Beyond the Mat, your kids are shrieking on camera yeah. and they're covering their eyes. Yeah. I mean, it broke my heart. It did mine, too. I remember B Barry Blaustein telling me, you know, he was like, I, I need for you to watch this. I said, what do you mean? He's, from my vantage point, by the time I got back, it was my daughter going, Daddy, it looks like you have a boo-boo. And I said, yeah, honey, Daddy's got a little boo-boo. And she said, Daddy, that looks like a big boo-boo. You know, and on the film, I go, yeah, it, it is a big. They were co completely composed by the time I saw them. I had no idea how how upset they'd been and after all this time like the strangest thing to me is that i thought it'd be perfectly fine like for them to watch me get stitched up you know like that wasn't a question mark in my in my head and so it was about that time you know late 1999 this is given that i was you know in route you know on course to make more money than i ever had you know with a couple of years coming up and um that man that guilt weighed so heavily on my uh you know, on my conscience and combined with the knee problems I was having and uh, the short term memory problems, you know, when I went to Vince and told him, uh, it, you know, told him what was up from a health standpoint, he said to me, you just had your last match. This is at a point, fast forward to October 99, uh, Al Snow and I just won the tag team championship. I had a book that was either at number three or number one on the New York Times list. And I've just had my last match, which I would have had it not been for the S Steve Austin neck injury. And that happened in November. Was it November yeah, 99? Yeah. And so there was this gaping hole in the, the roster. And, you know, fortunately, the sake of, you know, you know, closure and uh, finances, you know, there was that, that big hole and, and an opening for a guy to have a couple last matches and go out the way that, that I wanted to with Triple H. But I saw uh, your kids at WrestleMania 30. When when they look back now, I mean, and I can't believe, dude. I mean, it's been so long. Yeah, yeah. How old is Noel? Noel's 20. How old is Dewey? Tw Dewey's 22. Okay, now those are the, the two that I remember. Yeah, I know you yeah, have two yeah, more kids. Yeah. But uh, so now when this conversation comes up, how do they reflect on that? What do they remember about it? Are they okay? Did it scar them? Well, kids are resilient. They bounce oh, back. I knew he was going to say that. I knew he was going to say <laughs> Go that. John Go John Go-to patented answer, yeah. <laughs> you know what? By the time I even found out how badly they had taken it, they seemed to have recovered. But that didn't, you know, it didn't assuage my, you know, concerns. I was, I felt terrible. And then they started thinking that every day I went to work this is was what going to be like that. And they started getting old enough to realize that all those years of saying, oh, daddy's fine, daddy's fine, uh, they were coming to a point where my body was really starting to show the, the wear and tear, where it was limping really badly. I'd realize, you know, kicking a ball back and forth. That ball didn't travel exactly to me. I wasn't getting to it. I had yeah. no lateral movement, you know. But it was really, from Vince's standpoint, the head injuries – you know, that, that made, that caused him to say, you just had, you know, there's a guy and I'll be glad to, you know, to say bad things about Vince from time to time, but deep down, and I've had this, you know, conversation with people like deep down, I think Vince is a really good guy with a couple of quirks. <laughs> he is a good dude, man. I mean, he, that guy, hey, straight up, he wouldn't ask you to do anything that he would not do himself. That's the truth. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's the way he is. Here's another true statement. If Vince McMahon gives you his word, you don't need a piece of paper, correct? Correct. He's a man of his word. Yeah. Uh, man, I've had high times and low times with him and times <laughs> in between. I always tell people, man, I learned more working for Vince McMahon uh, than I did in five years of college. And I don't know. I just had a good – don't get me wrong. I mean, half the shit. I mean, you saw the Austin McMahon feud. You were there. Yeah. And, uh, you know, at times some of it was a shoot. <laughs>
<laughs> but yeah, I love the guy. I think I, I think he's a cool son. But there'll never be another one of him. He's the no. most unique individual I've ever met. No, nah, you put you put three guys in a room who've worked for him, and sooner or later they come around to Vince. Uh, you know, and and some guys are bitter, and and but most of the time you have the biggest smile on your face. <laughs> I think the bitter part of uh, being gone from the business is, you know. You know, some of the guys, it's, it's almost a, a parallel of the NFL. The big money wasn't around for everybody back then. And then yeah. it came into the big money, and it continues to be that way, as as it, as it has with everything. Yeah. So has been a parallel of professional wrestling. And so a lot of guys that, I don't know, didn't end up with what they thought they would end up. It just seems to be the guys that are better. But nonetheless, uh, he's a very unique dude. Hey, dude. Let's uh, let's shut this thing down and save uh, a lot more for round three. Can I just close by saying, Jimmy Crack Corn and, and I don't care. Jimmy Crack Corn and I don't care. Jimmy Crack Corn and I don't care. I've got Olympic gold. <laughs> you had to go down to, You know what? This is Steve Austin show. I'm going to call it Audible. Bonus with Mick Foley. <laughs> this sorry son of a bitch. I, where did you and me first meet? Okay, I know we met in Dallas. Yeah, okay, Dallas, but, but, but was, when did we decide we were going to start traveling together? Man, I think you know ninety. I came back in in ninety one, and uh, you know I I was with Abdul. I was with Abdul the yeah. Butcher for a while. I think it was after Abdullah left, and uh, sometime in you know the the winter ninety two, and that was when me, you, and DDP started. Hooking up and uh, creating some memories, me, you, and Regal, you know, yeah. for some 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 good. But we all, too. my point is, we always got along, and then all these years later, and then you and I end up in WWF, as you say, E. So there we are. It's I don't remember where the hell was it. Seemed like somewhere in the Midwest, and this was the Shrimp and Ain't Easy promo. Yeah, yeah. And was that a house show? Milwaukee, Milwaukee yeah, was it? Milwaukee was the one. See, of, here's the thing about you: you have such good recall. Yeah. And after all the steel chairs, you it's remember the long term is razor, razor sharp. Okay, you know, razor sharp, short. It's term. crazy how the long term and yeah. the short term are two different yeah. ball games. When I did the, and I don't mean to leave on a downer, but when I did that impact test, you know, when I went there and I didn't know how to game the test. Apparently, there's what guys who know what the test consists of and right. try to try to do poorly on it so that after an injury you know, they don't seem, they don't drop off. They're working it. Yeah, we're, which is just doing themselves a disservice. Right. But I took that test and, and, and I was answering all the questions and, um, and, and then when they come around and I realize this is about my short term memory and it's gone. It was, I mean, it was so distressing to me that independent of WWE that I called, uh, Dr. Cantu at the Boston center for traumatic, traumatic encephalopathy and I scheduled an appointment on my own, and it was like a day or two later that John Laurinaitis called me up, and he said, there's been an issue with your impact test. So I had two top neurologists telling me that my my time was done. I guess we're done here. No, 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 because <laughs> we're going to leave on a high note. When did the shrimp and ain't easy? How do we, how do we originally, that was a house show or yeah, television it was, taping? It was, I think it began as a way to, to annoy Jack Lanza. It began as a way to say, hey, hey, watch Steve. I but somebody recording, no, this, because it's, it's on record, it was, it, wasn't it when we went dark on a raw? It, you know what? I might be mixing up the the few because we went we went to it a few times. The right. climactic one, in my opinion, was shrimpin' ain't easy, pimpin' ain't, ain't easy, chimpin' ain't, ain't, ain't easy. Yeah. yeah, I'd have to go back and see it. I think I'm actually confusing it with the one in Milwaukee where uh, that was the the promo where Rock would come out and talk about you know your. your, your 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 monkey ass and Kane. No, what this was what did, you, did, did Jericho come out on this one? I I don't know. I, I don't can't know. remember. I'm thinking either. of the I'm thinking of the four way in Milwaukee where none of us could stop laughing. But and, it, and the thing was, as soon as as soon as one of us came up with a new gimmick, of course, the next guy's got a top hat, and it was a deal where I ain't got no hair. I got a, a mustache and a goatee, so. I'm laughing. Yeah. And, and then so, yeah. You put your hand I got my left arm. Yeah. It's like I'm trying to see what time it is right by my mouth so no one can see, you know, the uh, the very intense Stone Cold Steve Austin, of course, who we know does not have a sense of humor laughing. It was absolutely ridiculous. One other, we got to leave on one more high note. I had hurt my neck. Well, what a high note. I had hurt my neck, but they still needed me at the house shows. 
to help draw a house and to keep me, hey. you know, into people's eyeballs and be present. Is this the popcorn angel? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yourself and Owen Hart were working a program or y'all working on the road. And who was I out there? Was I there? You were out there as my second. I was there as your and, second. <laughs> and we almost got you to pop. We almost got you to laugh. And then we, you were on the fringe, and then we said, all right, we're going to go all out. We're going to go all out, out today. And, and we'd find the, the different foreign objects. And this is when I realized, you know, those hardcore rules, anything goes, you know, could be played one or one of two different ways. One was the way I specialized, you know, like the, the, that heavy concrete high impact stuff. But I also learned, in, you know, in 97 from like beeling Triple H off the top rope by his nose and with a pair of salad tongs, you know, that you could <laughs> have some fun as well. And so that night, like the, the killer gimmick was the Santa sack size of, you know, popcorn that you'd have from the, um, uh, from the, not catering, but the concession, the, the concession stand. stand. And uh, uh, Owen started hitting me with that bag, you know. And the the night, a couple nights before in Anaheim, I'd I'd, I'd unloaded like a, a box of a thousand soft drink lids, and as they're floating, down, they're floating down. No, no his <laughs> knees are buckling, <laughs> and so we almost had you there. And we finally come back, and I remember, you know, the, we there was some concerns. I think we were in Northern California, and Dave Meltzer from the Observer was going to be there. Like, we didn't want to stink the place up with Meltzer rating us. And then it was like, you know what? What type of men are we? Like, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to go out of our way to make this the worst match possible. If it involves popping stone cold. So um, Owen started hitting me with a Santa sack <laughs> size of popcorn. And when I went down, it appeared to the naked eye. Like I was just like, you know, like flopping about aimlessly, but in truth, that wasn't was the doing, case. I was creating an angel out of the debris of the popcorn. And when I got up and you saw that angel with the plus size ass, yeah. I saw what you were doing from the get-go. Mick Foley's laying in the middle of a ring. There, there's, man, literally, if you waited, it'd be 10 pounds. It was like a 50-gallon 50 50 yeah. bag or, or more of popcorn in the middle of the ring. You're laying in the middle of it, spreading and closing your arms and your legs over your head, making a snowman is what I would call it. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, I got my head on the mat. I'm laughing my ass off. It's the stupidest thing I've ever seen. My and, and really the night before, two nights before, when the, the, when the, 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 soft drink lids. when the soft drink lids, you know, like when you go to McDonald's and you get the damn Coke underneath the gimmick thing and you put the little lid on, yeah. it was a bag full of those, those was the weapon at hand. <laughs> And as those things were raining down, and was it Owen or you going, oh, Owen no. Was, Owen was the one. Because <laughs> Owen was the hokiest the knees, seller of the all knees time. knees buckling. Yeah. Uh, but it was that next night, and the go, the line that made me, you know, the, where we knew we'd done it. We see you laughing, and we see that back shaking, you know. You know that big back. Like you see the head's turning bright red. You got your arm over your – but everyone could see that you're yeah. laughing. Yeah. And, and we just – we're the only two people who could hear you go – you guys are the shits. <laughs> you guys are the shits. You're the shits. Go home. <laughs> I'm laughing my ass off. Dude, this this reminds me of one other time. Uh, what were we doing there? For some reason, Tony Atlas was working with Sting in WCW. Do you remember this yeah, occasion? I do. I do. And it was a jump spin kick that... that, that <laughs> you know the story. What were we doing at ringside? Remember, but they were having an awful. Right. It was somewhere in Charleston, South Carolina, some some little town, and I can't remember what happened. But that was the only other time I can really remember being ringside. I thought she was involved with the match. I, I didn't remember. I think we were just watching from afar, and I did, Sting, Hall of Fame wrestler. Yeah, like and I, I, I don't know Sting very well, but, all, but Sting, all, I love him to death and respect him. Sting needed someone. He needed some substance. To bring out the best in him. Yeah. And he didn't have it. <laughs> he didn't have it that night. <laughs> and Tony Atlas, I love him to death. One of my old travel partners as well. One of the strongest human beings in the world. And can drink beer too. But first, <laughs> they had the god awfulest match that night. And Tony's going with the old spot show stuff. He pulled my hair. You know, Tony's ball. <laughs> like, this is not working in a main event. You know, we're a national, international touring company. You can't go after you've seen, you know, P P Pillman and, and Brad Armstrong and you've seen Jushin Liger. <laughs> yeah. And you can't go out there with he referee pulled my hair. 
And they tried, and I, I, it was just us. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go out on this story. What was, the, what was the funniest thing that ever happened to you in the ring? Your entire career as a performer. I'm going back. This is the Milwaukee story that I, I mixed up. It was it was that. that, And I, I don't know if I can properly, like, uh, and especially given that Rock is now Hercules, it's difficult to think of him in this way. But when he would come out and talk about your monkey ass and yeah. Kane's red retarded ass and my fat ass, you know, at that point, and we're, we've come a long way as far as social issues, and it's not as funny to say, you know, just... But the line, it's still kind of funny. In 20 years, it won't be funny at all, which would be a good thing. But I said, you know, I heard you talk about, you know, the Kane's red ass and Steve's monkey ass and my fat ass. And it just seems to me that The Rock likes to talk about men's asses a lot. You know, we get the pop. And yeah. I, maybe it's true what they say. Maybe The Rock really does suck after all. And I start <laughs> giving the, the t- hand and tongue motion. And the idea is Rock is now, he's selling it by claiming he doesn't do what <laughs> yeah. I'm claiming he does. And every time he's selling it, the imaginary phallus in his hand gets bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and it wasn't until the next day in Milwaukee, it was an afternoon show, and we have a four or five way, you know, it's your, your main event. And he goes, man, that was funny yesterday. He goes, wouldn't it be funny if we like, took it a step further? <laughs> and it's just the visual. This is Hercules wiping away an imaginary load. <laughs> <laughs> like no, dismiss no, no. <laughs> and when I got out of the ring, I couldn't even cut my promo because all I could think of was Rock wiping away the imaginary load from this, from this larger than life penis that doesn't even exist. I went open my mouth, and all I could think of is the Rock with this imaginary load on his face, and I just I couldn't stop. No one even knew why I was laughing. You guys hadn't even heard the conversation. And I thought, oh man, I'm in trouble because this is this is a sold out house. Earl Earl Hebner's, you know, I, I look over Earl, it looked like he, Earl was so bright red, and, and you were head in there in the corner, you had your <laughs> arm over the thing, and every time I tried to, I couldn't do it. I was completely gone. I could not keep a straight face. This is the main event, and one of the things, the life's lesson I t- took from this was I looked out of the crowd thinking they're going to be hot. And they were laughing just as hard as we were. They yeah. didn't know why we were laughing, but they just knew that the guys in the ring were really, you know, loved what they did. Yeah. You know, like it was nice to see that human side. I can't remember a thing about the match. And I apologize to The Rock because there was no actual evidence. No, no, no. It was all comedy <laughs> back in the day. Oh, geez. He's the biggest movie star in the world. Remember one time, uh, this is my last story. <laughs> they just opened up that brand new building in Dallas, American Airlines. Right yeah. I got the phone call. Yeah, they had to open a new building in Dallas. Want you and the rock on top. Oh, shit, that sounds good to me. Call yeah. him. So there we go. Go to Dallas, Texas. Main event goes to the ring. Boy, we jump start it. All of a sudden, I back rock into the corner and start teeing off on him. He's about to go do a movie or something, but you know, so I was missing him by a mile. And I threw about six, seven hard ones. I spin me around. He spun me around, started throwing. He missed me by a mile, about six, <laughs> seven shots. I looked at him and said, God damn, one of us got to hit one another sooner or later. We're going to kill this something right off the bat. <laughs> It was the shits. Oh. Hey, we had a great time. Anyway, <laughs> hey, I'm sitting here talking to Mick Foley. This was the second part of a, a two-part uh, gimmick here on the Steve Austin show. We're all over the page because I've known this guy forever. To cover everything in a chronological fashion would be a disservice to the time that we've spent together and the fact that I'm not a bona fide journalist. <laughs> Mick Foley will return to the area soon or whenever he does, and we will pick up right where we left off. Uh, good Lord willing, the creek don't rise, and then he wants to come back on the show. Hell, you might have had a shitty time. No, this, we've, been, we've been talking about it for a long time. We knew it was something we had to do live, couldn't do it by phone, and I, I'm glad we held out, and I hope you know you, you, this uh, lived up to people's lofty expectations. The, the way, you know, I mean, I got into starting doing this podcast thing, Mick, and I talked to a lot of people on the phone. I Skype with people. And sometimes there's a little bit of lag time there yeah. on that Skype. And when that vo- that that sound hits your earphones, it's a little bit of a clusterfuck. And I knew with our background, I just didn't want a phone call with you. You want it to be as good as it can possibly be. Yeah. yeah. And I'd, lo- I'd love that with everybody, that just, but that's just not the case. 
and Jim Ross, my buddy's doing a hell of a job down there in Norman, Oklahoma. His show drops every Wednesday. It's the Ross Report. I know you did his yeah, show a while sure back. Did, yeah. So anyway, just a, just a plug to at JR's Barbecue on Twitter. Speaking of Twitter, I'm talking to at Real Mick Foley. Yes, there's the fake one out there. Don't follow that son <laughs> bitch. His website is realmcfoley.com. Real you can catch all his comedy dates. He's on the road doing his thing. And I said comedy, but it's it's, it's stories. Time. It's a one man story time. Laugh. It's, it's, it, it does really. Uh, hey, you ain't you ain't made a motherfucker cry yet, have you? <laughs> At your show. No, I mean embarrassing them. No, yeah. no, just cry just oh, because your show was so bad. <laughs> No, your show's about a good time. And <laughs> yeah, it, 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 people it's leave. They, you not know necessarily what? a one-man stand-up act. Yeah. I, you know, there was a guy talking about my laughs per minute, and I look at laughs like pops in the ring. It's it's not about how many you get. It's the way people feel when they walk out of that building. If they got a huge smile on their face, and I think I got a really good big smile ratio, you know. And so the stuff I say is not going to be as laugh-out-loud funny as – top comics but uh, it's 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 good it's good storytelling no but see here's the deal dude let me cut you off i mean the, what what you're saying is just like going to japan whether it's new japan or all japan you know you've been there yeah all of a sudden you're in the back it's your first time over there you watch justin lager and uh eddie guerrero go out there and mix it up you're like how do i follow that yeah well you just go out there and do your thing and so you that's tell, what you're yeah, doing you, tell you don't try to be right. uh sam kennison or try right. to be andrew dice clay or eddie murphy some of those cats you're doing your thing Doing my thing and pe- people like it. Uh, everyone's got unique stories. I'm, I'm pretty sure in a couple of years there could be some other guys waiting in, and uh, I think it's a pretty big canvas. You know, we can all uh, leave our uh, our own imprint on there. I, I just love it, man. And it just going back to what we talked about last week. It makes me feel like I used to feel in the ring without the uh, the physical fallout. What do you do after a show, dude? You 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 back in your car because I know you do the autograph thing afterwards. But is, is there that same adrenaline rush? Sometimes, yeah. If you uh, really feel like you hit it out of the park, it feels like coming back after a great promo. Does your wife ever say to you, "Hey, man, you got to get your ass off the road"? Yeah, you know what? Yeah, I mean, July was a t- you know, July was twenty two days away from home. Um, that was a little long. It's a pretty you know sweet spot in the kids' lives. Eleven and thirteen, they need summer. Dad, yeah, they need dad around a little more. So I'm gonna try to make it. Uh, I was. Uh, you say try. You yeah. seem like you hell bent on staying on the road. What no, guess? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna make a pact um, to uh, to be home at least half the month, and that's where, a pact. Yeah, now, what's driving you, dude? A pact. I, I will. I'm, I'm making a promise to my wife. Uh, that I will be home at least half the month. Do you want to be on the road that much? Can you? I mean, did you not get it out of your system? Well, I do. I mean, I, I like I like life. On, I do like life on the road. I like. And I, like I always solitude. say when I got a business, I, I returned back to, and it took me three years to make the adjustment to being a civilian. I'm a civilian now. <laughs> Can you not return to civilian no, man. status? I wrote about this in, in 2007 in uh, Hardcore Diaries. It's like the Bob Seger song. You know, he wants to live like a young man with the wisdom of an old man. He wants to live. He wants his home in security. He wants to live like a sailor at sea. And then Bob's this beautiful loser. You realize you can't just can't have it all. It's like, but I kind of can. You know, like I can right. go out there. I can do my thing. I can have my fun, I can make my money, I go home, and, and it's quality time. That's one thing. I remember Jake Roberts gave me a book called The 60-Minute Father about maximizing your time uh, when you're home. So, I mean, uh, when I'm home, yeah, I'm pretty good. You know, I'm pretty good. We spend a lot of time. The new documentary, uh, I Am Santa Claus, we drop in, in theaters and in on DVDs. Um, uh, right around Thanksgiving. And one of the things I'm really thankful about is that my son, Huey, is in it quite a bit, and my son, Mickey, a little bit as well. It's kind of like they're beyond the mat, like their experience with their dad, but doing something so much more peaceful and serene. It's interesting because next time you come back, as I sit here in my little uh, office at 316 Gimmick Street in Los Angeles, California, Mick Foley's got a green shirt with Santa Clauses all over it. <laughs> I want to understand what your infatuation is with Christmas. But before we go... One last story. When you got inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame, right? how satisfying was that to you? Did that validate everything that you'd done because you'd had as many naysayers that you did that you were just a big bump guy? Uh, did you have a chip on your shoulder? Was there something you know to prove? Is- was it just a deep-down satisfaction for you as your contributions to the business that you and I love? 
I always had this sense that I I wouldn't let anyone define my career by whether or not I was uh, inducted into a Hall of Fame. At the end of the day, it's Vince's you know decision. And I even said like I would tell them I would say, well, if it's a big deal to my kids, I guess I would. And the game changer for me was the day that I got a call from Kevin Dunn. And I was working for TNA at the time, and Kevin asked me how I would feel about WWE mentioning my book on their show, <laughs> which is like un, unheard of, you know. Yeah. And so I went in, and uh, we watched that show together. I didn't tell my kids they were thinking about mentioning it. And the moment that they mentioned that, that Michael Cole and the King mentioned the book, like it was a moment I changed my mind. And said if I'm asked, I'll go in no conditions no i go on last no you know no conditions at all uh, oddly like up until a day or two before the hall of fame induction uh it had been brought to my attention that i my tv time might be cut for donald trump and i let that get to me like i let things get to me about every six months to the point where i called up my daughter and told them i told her i didn't want anyone coming i didn't want i didn't want to give anybody the power to you know, to hold over me. I didn't want, I was going to make this as unimportant as I could. And that way the blow would not be as devastating when I was cut from TV. And luckily by the time I got on the stage, it didn't matter to me that I was on first. I never looked at it like it was anything but the biggest event in my life. I, I, I understood or, or of my career. I understood from a certain vantage point, or a perspective that I would pro and this may be my last opportunity to address an audience that size in my life, especially for that length of time with my own stories. You know, I might be able to go back out there with something that someone else had written for me under some serious time constraints. And I was in the garden, which meant so much to me. I had my, my family with me. I had friends who'd been with me since I was 12. And it was the garden where I had gone and seen Snooka die off the top of the cell. I just had this, you know, conscious, uh, you know, feeling of acceptance uh, that I was going to enjoy the moment. And I did. I mean, the moment when I, 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 the one thing I regret is when I dropped the elbow on Jericho and I got up and I yelled, you Adrian, and I did it. I'm thinking, go home, go home, yeah. go home. And I didn't go home. That would have made it a perfect night, you know. And then I had Santa come out at the end and, uh, you know, to surprise, to surprise. It was a, it was a great night. It didn't bother me at all that I was on first. It didn't bother me. You know, I was glad that I had Terry and, and not a, you know, not a celebrity or not somebody had been picked for me that I was able to make that choice. And that the only, uh, uh, the only prerequisite before going out there is that Vince didn't want us talking about him, you know, thanking him, yeah, yeah, which yeah, I yeah. can, which I can appreciate. And so, uh, it didn't, it didn't validate everything for me because honestly, and I'm not like talking up to the current generation, but those guys make me feel like I'm in the Hall of Fame. The way I, yeah, I mean, you get the same treatment. The way I'm treated on a day to day basis by people in the streets and by the WWE superstars and divas when I go back every now and then made me feel like I was, in there anyway well next time you come back i want to talk to uh some of those barbed wire death matches all that <laughs> bullshit and then i mean that with respect you was doing over japan some that crazy shit what was that with onita no i was uh, onita was the uh the strong we were the opposition we okay, were opposition japan it was it was terry you know and it was tracy smothers all right well don't go into but, it yet yeah. i want to catch that on the next go around because that was some crazy ass yeah. shit dude i watched some barbaric brutal